Hi, I'm Sharon Colvin. I'm the Youth Services Consultant for the Vermont Department of Libraries. Happy November. I have a ton of books to show you today. I have a good pile of uh, picture books. I have a couple of interesting nonfiction, and then I'm going to go into um, early uh, elementary level, and then I have a huge pile of YA. Um, so let's get started. So the first book, Who Doesn't Love Bob Graham? You can't not love him, right? This book is adorable. I really think um, this is one of those classic, quiet Graham books um, that you're really going to want. Um, it's How the Sun Got to Coco's House. And so it's basically um, a trip around the world with the sun. So it starts off here with the polar bears. And then it travels. And it goes across the oceans. And then it goes and it says hi to a whale from the sun's perspective and then it keeps going and it goes to the woods and then it goes and some people on a plane see it and then it keeps going and going um, and it goes through a forest and it goes I think this has got to be like the Middle East or Africa or something um, and then there's some camels I keep holding it on the wrong side, sorry. Camels, and it keeps going, and it goes over the mountains, it goes to the city, and it meets a little boy who's delivering a papers, and then it finally comes back to Coco's house. So first, it wakes her parents up, and then breakfast, and they make um, a snowman, and then there's a whole kind of a panoramic view of the city and the sun. They spent the whole day together. So it's really sweet. Um, it's kind of a trip around the world and, um, you know, a lesson in perspective. Um, but it's also just a beautifully done book. Um, so highly, highly recommend it. Could be good read aloud, um, but also good for sharing. All right, this one is very different. Um, this is called Out of the Woods, and it's a true story. Um, and I love the end pages. Look at those end pages. Gorgeous. Um, this is a really interesting story about a boy named Antonio who lives in a hotel with his mom. His mom ran the hotel. And the art is very rustic around line drawings. So he lives in the hotel, and it's on the side of a lake. And um, he doesn't have any friends. There's no kids his age. And so he hangs out in the forest, and he makes friends with the lumberjacks and the people who come and visit the hotel, um, which is great. Until one day, there's a fire in the hotel. And this is based on a true story. Um, so there's a great big fire. And as you know, in the past, hotel fires were very dangerous. Um, and so the whole, everyone who was in the hotel goes to the lake. Um, to be safe. And then they notice that the animals follow them. And pretty soon, everyone's in the lake together, trying to run away from the flames. And so, um, in the end, no one ends up getting hurt, um, which is a great, happy ending. Um, and they go back to the hotel. They're lucky the hotel does not burn down. Um, but it's basically just a story about this community that came together um, and the forest animals and the people all came together to survive out in that lake. Um, and I just think the pictures are great. And I think it's a good kind of adventure story that you, maybe your older um, kids might really enjoy in story time. Um, plus, you can tell them it was based on a true story, which is always fun. All right, this one is great. Imaginary Fred. Um, so... Kids who have imaginary friends will really like this book. Um, so this is, um, the art is great. Let's look at this line art. It's not the flashiest ever, but I think it's great. Um, so it's about an imaginary friend named Fred. Sorry, the book's really stiff. Let me stay open. So there's Fred, and that's his imaginary friend. And um, he was always happy to come and play, and um, and he paid attention to, to him when the grown-ups ignored him. And um, 
he would come and dream with him and they would have adventures. And then um, he made a special friend. Sam wishes for an imaginary friend and Fred becomes his imaginary friend. So it's this whole story. It's kind of in depth. So it might be a little bit long for story time. This might actually be better for your kids who are uh, just starting to learn how to read. Um, but this is about this imaginary friend, and then he meets other imaginary friends. And I've noticed this is a trend. Um, there's lots of imaginary friends in, in books these days. I'm not really sure what the story is there. Um, but I think it's really great. There you go. There's even some other people imaginary friends. The kids can start imagining what their imaginary friends would look like when they got older. And there you go. You see those imaginary friends living happily ever after. Um, so this book, like I said, it's a little thick. Um, it might not be the best book for story time, but I think it's really cute. Um, and if you have kids in your community or in your story time who have imaginary friends, this could be a really good one to read. Um, and I just think the art is great. You know, it's just only the imaginary friends are in color, which I think is telling. All right, this one's really cute, Too Many Toys. This book could be really good if you're doing um, like a community toy drive or food drive during the holidays um, because it's about a kid who has too much stuff. So she starts out and she has, her name is Lulu, and she has a teddy bear named Jupiter, and Jupiter is her best friend ever. But the problem is, is every holiday she gets more and more toys until they take over her room and it just becomes this problem where she has too many toys and what is she going to do? So one day um, she decided to have a great giveaway in her yard. She gave away all of her toys and she gave them good homes and she gave them all to different kids and then in the end she kept her best friend, Jupiter. So it's a really simple idea, simple story, but I do think it has a nice message in it, and it could be really good um, if you're doing some sort of charity drive during the holidays um, to kind of explain to kids um, that you don't need to have all those toys. If you keep your very best friends, um, then everyone, all the rest of them can be given to kids who don't have toys. Um, all right, so this story just came out. It's called I'm New Here. Um, there are a lot of books about diversity, and I think this is one of the better ones. Um, sometimes they feel a little forced, but this one's really wonderfully done. It's called I'm New Here, and it starts with these three kids who are new. So this is Maria, and this is Jin, and this is uh, Fatima. And so they're all new, and the expressions in the art are fantastic. Um, and basically, it's kind of like a, it's definitely perspective lesson um, in what the language sounds like to someone who doesn't speak English, um, and that everything is foreign. And back home, I could read in white, right? I shape the letters and stack them like blocks into words. The words open like windows and doors into a story. But here there are new letters. They lie on the page like scribbles and scratches, and all the windows and doors are shut tight. Um, I really think this is a good um, empathy building book about what it's like to be in a totally different community. Um, and you know, this girl here, she used to belong, she used to fit in, and now she has no idea what to do and she's really nervous. Um, and this teacher um, has them do an art project and um, this girl wants to play soccer, but she can't even say the word. She's really fighting with the word in her mouth and she finally communicates with the kids and she's able to play and um, this, this little boy is trying to learn how to write, and he's staring at these lines on the paper, and they just don't make any sense. And then he makes a friend, and they start to teach each other. And then Fatima draws a picture, and the kids love it. And so she draws more and more. And so towards the end, it's here are new beginnings. And I love how diverse the pictures are. Um, these are not the only, you know, um, the only non-white kids in the school. I think that's great. It's important. Um, but look at all those kids. Um, and so the teacher's doing this community project, so they're all drawing pictures of their community. Um, and then the end, it's here is a new home. So I really like this book. I think this is really good um, if you have, well, it's good for every community, but if, especially if you have kids 
um, who are here from other countries or kids who are learning English, this could be a really good um, book for your kids to talk about what it's like to be new. Um, but if you don't have these kinds of children in your book, in your schools or in your community, this might be good too, just to um, to learn a little bit about what it's like to be different. This book is hilarious, the big, the fun book of scary stuff. And so this book goes through the, all the things that this kid is scared of. So these are the things he's scared of. Scary things. Monsters, ghosts, witches, trolls. And so um, he has two dogs who are going to help him because they don't understand why he's scared of things. And so they go through them one by one. So first they say monsters. And um, the dogs are like, I'm not scared of monsters. His mom says they eat anyone who doesn't stay in their bed. And so basically the dogs are trying to talk him out of his fears each time. And the dog says, I don't stay in my bed. I sleep in your bed. No monsters ever get me. And then they talk about ghosts. And I hate that you can see through them. Um, but did you know that ghosts are scared of dogs? So he talk, they talk them out of his, his fears every time. And then he moves on to real stuff, like my cousin Jim, Jemina, um, who puts ice cubes down his shorts. And the dogs say, um, oh, I bit her. He's like, yay, nice work. Okay, I didn't really bite her. I ran away. So they start to become kind of... Um, in tune with each other in terms of having the same fears and then he starts talking about other things he's scared of like swimming pools um what if there are sharks in the bottom um and the dogs say oh don't worry about it i could take them and then the very last thing that he's afraid of is the dark of course and the dogs are like what now that's scary so there they are in the dark <laughs> and they're all scared and they're making noises of course and they're scared, and the little boy says, calm down, it's okay. And they're like, the dark, it just gets me. He says, yeah, but you know what you can do when you're scared of the dark? You can turn on the light. <laughs> so in the end, the boy is the one who's, who's brave. And the dogs say, you're so brave, you saved us from evil. And he says, maybe I am. And then in the end, he goes and gets them some treats. So it's a really good book. You know, it's going to be funny for the kids because... You know, it's about trolls and monsters and ghosts and stuff, but it's also about fears and about, you know, getting over your fears. And the dogs are hysterical, so, and, you know, who's braver than a dog? Okay, this book is adorable. It's called Wait. Um, it's almost wordless. There are only two words in the whole book, hurry and wait. Um, and it's basically about an adventure this kid and his, his grown-up have through the city. Um, so, you know, she's dragging him along and it says, hurry. And then they see a dog. Wait. And then they're marching on down the street. Hurry. And then, oh, someone's waving. Wait. <laughs> and then it keeps going. So they hurry past the pond, but they have to wait to feed the duck. And they hurry past the ice cream truck, but they have to wait to get in line for some ice cream. And then they have to hurry um, across the street, and they have to wait to look at the fishes. And then they have to hurry past the bush, but he sees a butterfly, so you got to wait for the butterfly. And then they have to hurry in the rain, and hurry up the stairs in the rain, and hurry to the train, and then wait on the train. <laughs> and then they see a rainbow. And mom says, yes, wait. So I think this is a really cute book. Um, it could be good for story time, especially if you have little ones. Um, I think that it'll make the, the adults tear up, um, which is always good. But it's also just a good sharing story. And it's just so well done. <clears throat> okay, this one's also based on a true story, Ketzel the Cat Who Composed. I love cats. I pick up all cat books. This one is pretty good. Um, I At first I read it and I thought, really but it's based on a true story so you know this is about um a composer and he um lived in a city and he uh composed all by himself until one day he found this little baby kitten and so he brings the kitten home and puts him on top of the piano and you know the piano noises freak him out a little bit um but he says you're going to be a great composer um the little kitten's name is Ketzel 
And then one day he has writer's block and he can't think of anything. And he's entering a contest and there's certain parameters and he just can't do it. And the kitten, um, he sees the announcement for the contest and he's like, that's what's upsetting my, my, my human. So he's, the kitten decides to destroy it on the keys of the key of the piano. <laughs> so, um, but of course the composer listens to it and thinks, yes, that's the song. And so he composes this piece. Um, that he ends up calling um, Peace for Piano, Four Paws, written by Quetzalcoatl, which is the cat's name, and he submits it to this contest. So he ends up going um, to hear his piece played in this big concert hall, and of course he brings the cat with him. And so he's got the cat with him. Wait, don't listen. You can see him. There he is, the cat. And of course, the cat knows his name, and so um, the little girl who's going to play the piece announces, it's by Quetzal, and the cat goes, meow. It's like, it's by Quetzalcoatl, meow. And so anyway, they have a, a cow because there's a cat in the theater, but then they realize the cat has written the piece. So they bring the kitty up to take a bow, and they play um, the piece of music. And in the end, the cat is the one that gets the royalty check. <laughs> right. Um, anyway, and then, you know, he bought some cat food with the court to check. And then there's some information at the end about the true story. Um, and it took place in 1943. And, um, it, he went to Juilliard and, you know, there's a whole piece about it. So it's a really, it's a cute story. Um, you can talk to the kids about whether or not animals can compose music, because I'm sure they have opinions about that. Um, but, this could be good, especially if you have musically inclined um, individuals in your library. Um, this one also, a true story. Um, this is the story of George Moses Horton. He was a poet, a slave poet. Um, and this is a sweet story. I have mixed feelings about the art. Um, it's not my personal style, but the big head, I don't know, seems a little, um, I don't know, spoofy to me, I guess, which I don't think is particularly appropriate, but at any rate, it's a good story. Um, so he loves words, but of course he's a slave, so he's not allowed to learn to read and write. His mother gives him um, a Bible, and he finds um, a spelling textbook that probably belonged to the, um, his owners, and he starts to learn to read. And But meanwhile, he's working. Um, and then when he's 17, the family is split up. Um, and so they, he's worried that he's not ever going to see his family again. Um, and so, you know, it's about a poet, but I think this will give a really nice insight into what slavery was like for kids because um, it's, you know, about this kid who has these very small dreams of learning how to read and write, and then he's 17 and he's taken away from his family. Um, and I think that's something that's really going to bring it home for the kids. Um, so anyway, he, he does teach himself how to learn to read, to read and write, and he recites poetry, and he becomes famous for reciting poetry, and people start bringing him books um, in exchange for his poems, and um, he starts getting paid for his poems, and the problem is, is that he's not free, you know, he's still a slave, and um, so he starts getting published um, in different newspapers, and he's able to um, pay his master, um, but, you know, slavery is still, um, you know, a big problem here. And then the abolitionists start to rise up, and life gets pretty confusing, and um, they start to try to abolish slavery, and then the Civil War happens, and now he's an older man, and he's trying to fight for his freedom. And by the time he does, he's older, um, and he's still writing. And um, this book, I think, is just really sweet. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of information at the end about this character, about this person, and about what it took. And I think um, this, the resources here from the author um, are great if you're doing a lesson. Um, and I just think this is a really good way to kind of bring home what slavery really meant um, to the kids. It really wasn't that long ago. Okay, this one is spectacular. I'm going to move back a little bit because this book is enormous. It's called Counting Lions, and it is freaking amazing. This is, I just, I think this is a line drawing, um, but it's absolutely beautiful. 
Um, all right, so this is a counting book, but it's unlike any counting book I've ever seen before. There's one lion, and then there's a little poem underneath, and then there's two gorillas, and then there's a poem there, and then there's um, three giraffes, four tigers. Look at that tiger. The tiger is gorgeous. So it keeps going. Um, there are five elephants, six Ethiopian wolves, seven penguins, eight turtles. Gotta love the turtles. Um, and this book is enormous. It's huge. And every page has a different poem. Um, there's nine macaws, ten zebras. These are great animals um, for the kids. These are things that they, they would have seen in the, in the zoo. There's information about every animal in the back of the book. Um, including um, their protected status um, as of the publication of this book and some information about them. Um, so I think this is a phenomenal book. The art is really one of a kind. Um, and I think your kids are going to adore this book. Even if they can just look at the pictures, I think that it's worthwhile purchase. Um, you might want to reinforce the pages <laughs> to make sure it doesn't fall apart. All right, so that's all I have for picture books. Um, I'm going to move on. I have one poetry book, some nonfiction, and then we'll move on to the chapter books. Um, so the one poetry book I have today is in picture book form, um, but I'm not sure that you'd want to put it with a picture book. This book is um, a poetry book that takes place in amazing places, and here's the map of all the amazing places that they feature. And so there's a poem that goes with each of these amazing places and a drawing. Um, so this one takes place in Green Bay, Wisconsin. It's crooked, sorry. It's hard for me to tell. <laughs> it's crooked. Um, and there's one that takes place in Chinatown in San Francisco, um, Dallas, Texas at a state fair. Um, there's one about Mississippi River, um, the Ringling Circus Museum in Sarasota, Florida, the Liberty Bell. And there's just really great art, and I think this could be a good um, book, especially if you're a school librarian, for introducing different parts of the country to the kids, um, and also just different um, types of poetry. So there's quite a bit of concrete poetry here. Um, this is a lighthouse in um, Sandy Hook in New Jersey, um, and there's one at the end that I really, oh, here it is, the Niagara one. Another one, it looks like a waterfall. So I think you could do some interesting stuff um, with this. It's a decent poetry book, plus um, learning about different parts of the country. Always fun. All right, so I have two nonfiction for you. Um, the first one is a little odd, um, but I think your kids might be interested in it. It's called The Rain Wizard. The cover is kind of awesome. So this takes place um, in San Diego, California in the early 1900s, and it's there was a big drought, which, just like today, and um, they hire a rainmaker, and you just listen, listen to that for a second, a rainmaker, right? So there's this legendary rainmaker, his name was Charles Malloy Hatfield, and he had this like special scientific way of making rain, and he never revealed his methods, um, but um, he did actually make rain and there was a lot of flooding. Um, the pictures in here are fantastic. Um, it's set up into chapters. Um, the writing is pretty dense. It's probably like a, I don't know, fifth, sixth, middle school-ish, um, depending on the reading level um, of the kids. And um, not flashy photography. Uh, most of it's not in full color, um, but it is really interesting. Um, pictures of dams and reservoirs, things like that. So if you're looking for um, interesting nonfiction, um, this is fairly narrative. Yeah, it's pretty narrative. So if you're looking for something like that, it could be good. Um, yeah, and um, maybe not like a researchy type book. Um, but if you have kids who are interested in narrative nonfiction, this one could be a good choice. All right, the next one. <coughs> this one has gotten a ton of press. Um, the Boy Who Fell Off the Mayflower. So it's been a while since we had an interesting Mayflower book, right? Um, this book looks like a picture book, but it's actually quite substantial. And I would say it's more elementary level um, than anything else. 
And um, it could have been published as a short chapter book, um, but they wanted to include these awesome pictures. Um, so it's about a boy who fell off the Mayflower, and um, the photographs are, I don't have photographs, the artwork is phenomenal. But you can see the text is pretty dense. Um, it's, it's a real story. Um, and there's some pretty grim pictures of what it was like to be on board. Um, and it's, let me see how many pages this is. I don't even think there are page numbers on this. Um, it's probably, I don't know, 60, 60 70 pages. Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty decent length. Um, so this isn't something you're probably going to want to read aloud unless you have several days to, um, to devote to it, but it could be a good story. Um, the only trouble with it is that because it's in a picture book form, um, teachers tend to not believe that there's real text in here, and kids tend to think that they're babyish. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. <clears throat> there's a decent bi bibliography in here, um, and they're actually broken up by age level, which is kind of awesome. Um, so there's younger readers and there's books. Um, so if you have kids who are interested in this kind of um, period of time, narrative nonfiction, um, or if you're just looking to beef up your, your selection in your um, nonfiction section, this one could be a good one. Um, you know, you could market it as an adventure story and get um, some of your adventure readers to read it, um, but you have to get through the, the format problem. All right, moving on to chapter books. Um, this is a young, young chapter book. Um, it's called The Tale of Rescue, and you can see it's pretty young. Um, and it is about a family in the Appalachian foothills in Ohio. Um, they've gone to um, there for vacation from Florida. They want to see the snow, and there's a blizzard, and um, it's basically a survival story, how they get out. The family um, is really struggling. There are pictures, not a lot of pictures, but a few, um, and there's a snow dog um, who helps rescue them. Um, so I'm assuming that since it's kind of a young age, that it's going to be a happy ending. Also, the pictures look pretty happy. Um, and I really, really hope the dog doesn't die. No, I don't think so. <laughs> I always read ahead to the end to make sure the dog doesn't die. Because I would hate to give you a book and then find out the dog dies. Anyway, this one looks pretty good if you have um, adventure lovers, um, kids who are reading at kind of a low level, but really want that good, hearty adventure. This one could be a good one for them. Okay, I've heard a ton about this book. It's called The Doldrums, which sounds kind of boring, <laughs> but I've heard it's quite an adventure story. Um, this is about um, a boy named Archer, and Archer, um, his grandparents disappeared. Um, is this the one? Um, no, I'm sorry. I, I totally messed it up with another book. I read too much. Um, okay, so he lives in this house full of oddities, um, and his grandparents um, are... Oh, no, no, this is the one. Okay, scratch that. His grandparents were adventurers, and they got lost in the, in the Antarctic. And um, so his mom is really afraid to leave, let him leave the house and is really, really overprotective. But they are, their house is full of junk. And so he makes his own adventures in the house. Um, and he has he makes a couple of friends, and they decide to go on an adventure. And so he decides to go rescue his um, grandparents from the, the Antarctic, Antarctica. Um, and so he goes on this wild adventure. Um, and then, of course, everything is going to go awry because that's what happens in these stories. Um, but I've heard it's wonderful. We've, it's gotten rave review in the Canfield Fisher um, Award Committee. And um, it's a hefty book, though, I have to warn you. It's really heavy. Um, and it's an $18 book. Um, it's 340 pages. Um, there, I think there are pictures. Are there pictures? There are some pictures in it. Um, but it's, you know, it's one of those books where it's picked, printed on that really heavy archival paper. They expect it to be, um, you know, popular. <laughs> so it's heavy. Um, but kids who like hefty storybooks will like it, will like the size, the heft. Um, all right, so this book looks really interesting. The Rules for Stealing Stars. This book has been compared um, to Wendy Mass. 
um, and Sharon Creech, which those are the heavy hitters. Um, so this story is about a girl named Silly, which really, all right, her girl, her name is Silly, and she has three older sisters, and she gets left out, and um, so they just moved to New Hampshire. Her mom's an alcoholic and drinks all the time. Her dad is kind of ignores everybody and pretends like everything's fine and her three older sisters kind of ignore her and have these like secret meetings all the time without her because she's the baby and no one ever wants to tell her anything and so one day she um, peeks into their one of those secret meetings and she finds out that they're doing glittery sparkly things and they're talking to the closet and it turns out that the closet is magical and it's a secret portal and the closet provides so there's a little bit of you know magical realism here obviously um but i think at its heart um the reviews are saying it it's about you know this dysfunctional family and what it's like to be the youngest and also what it's like to deal with an alcoholic parent um and you know how you fit in um so of course there's magical realism so this looks like a, a pretty decent book all right next sequel you know i don't review sequels very often um but calpurnia tate was one of my favorite books of all time and the sequel has finally come out i think it's been four years um this looks wonderful it's gotten kind of lukewarm for you know reception but i'm gonna read it anyway because i love this story if you have kids in your library who love this book i know it's a hard sell it's not you know it's not one of those books that jumps off the shelf but if you have kids in your library who loved it this is out um, and you should get it if you know it didn't jump off the shelf then you might not need it which is sad but it's the way of life isn't it all right this one looks interesting it's called the book of dares for lost friends um, which I think is an interesting title um, it's about these two girls it's that you know normal trope of two friends who are, are um, growing apart and they've just started middle school and one friend kind of loses her way is with a bad crowd makes some bad decisions and then the other friend um she um, meets a strange boy in a book in a bookshop and they start a quest to try to save her lost friend um and I, it sounds like there's a little bit of magical realism in here um adventure and you know at its heart it's going to be a you know a friends falling um having a falling out growing apart and then finding each other um it has gotten really good reviews and it looks decent and you know these type of books never go out of style all right who doesn't love lauren oliver i adore her um this book looks amazing it's the start of a new series um called curiosity heist house and this one's called the shrunken head and let me just read you the description because i thought it was hysterical this book is about, among other things, the strongest boy in the world, a talking cockatoo, a faulty mind reader, a beautiful bearded lady, a nervous magician, an old museum, and a shrunken head. <laughs> so um, these are about these orphans um, who live in Dumfries Dime Museum of Freaks, Odysseys, and Wonders. You can see why I had to read that. Um, and so they have all of these crazy adventures, um, and it just, it looks like good fun. Um, Oh, right. There are things you will not find in this book. Are you ready? An accountant named Seymour, a never-ending line at the post office, Brussels sprouts. I like Brussels sprouts. Um, a lecture on finishing all your homework on time, a sweet gooey story for nice little girls and boys. I think that's enough of a book talk for any kid, right? Um, if, if, if her previous books are any indication, this one's going to be great fun. Um, so definitely a, a to read. Um, all right, so that's all I have for um, the middle grade fiction. I'm moving on to YA. Um, and first, I'm going to start off with the graphic novel. Um, Neil Gaiman has been re-releasing um, some of his books from, I think it's Rag and Bone, which was a, a collection of stories. And this book was in it, um, and it was um, separated out and published separately. And it's for uh, middle school, high school. And it's a mashup of um, Sleeping Beauty and Snow White. And it looks darn creepy. Um, so actually, I lied. It's not actually a graphic novel, um, but it's illustrated. And the text is very small and very dense. Definitely not for the faint of heart or for the young. Um, and kids who like twisted fairy tales, which those are very popular these days, um, could really get into this one. And there are, are a few of these out there. Um, this one just happened to get some good reviews. 
This book looks bizarre. Um, the Martians. <laughs> I know. Um, this author, um, what's her name? Blythe Woolston. She wrote another book called um, Black Helicopters, which was a freaky short book. Um, so she's really good at the, the short, intense kind of heart-pounding novels. Um, and this one definitely has that sense. Only there's a little more whimsy to it. Um, so this is about the last girl. Her name is Zoe Zindelman, um, and she's just graduated, and she works at this giant box store called AII Mart, and um, she doesn't want to disappear into the, the abyss. This is kind of the world where um, big box stores and shopping have taken over. That's all people do, and she's the last girl, so she's not interested. She wants to get out. Um, and so um, they describe it as a world of ex-urban decay studded with big box stores where its inhabitants are num numbed by shopping and the six o'clock news. <laughs> so it looks pretty disturbing, definitely dystopic, but it's short. And um, her other book, like I said, was tight and a little freaky. So if you have reluctant readers or readers who, kids who just want to have something they can read in one sitting, this could be um, a good choice for them. It's probably... Um, it's 212 pages, so it could be a really quick read. All right, next. Um, this, the cover, I don't know, something about the ripped baseball just reminds me of blood and guts. Um, but that's my issue, apparently. It's called See No Color, and it's about a girl who's biracial, and she's adopted. Um, she has, I think, two older siblings who are biological um, children of her parents, and she's adopted. And they don't talk about the fact that she's biracial. They just talk about her being, you know, they love their, all their kids the same. But the problem is, is that the white kids in her school don't accept her, and the black kids in her school don't accept her because she's mixed. Um, and so her dad is a baseball coach, that's why the baseball, and she dreams of uh, becoming a player. And so she is um, 16, and so she's still one of the boys. She's running around playing baseball. She loves it. Um, but then she meets um, this boy named Reggie, who is the first black guy who ever paid her any attention. Um, so at the same time, she's kind of in coming into her own in terms of her racial identity. She's also coming into her own in terms of um her um, sexual identity, kind of, oh, I'm a girl, and it's going to get in the way of um, playing baseball as one of the boys. Um, it's kind of a, it's definitely a coming-of-age story, um, but it has that different twist. There are not that many biracial books out there, if you can believe it, um, and so this one's going to be important, and I've heard it. It's pretty good, um, so you might find a place on your shelves. This story is <clears throat> historical fiction. And the cover is bizarre, um, but it is about this enormous school explosion that happened in New London, Texas in 1937. I had never heard of this. I had to actually look it up. Um, but apparently there was this school and there was a natural gas leak and it exploded. And um, back in the time, in 1937, it was the biggest school disaster ever to happen. Now I think it's well, after all the school shootings, who knows? Um, but anyway, this was is pretty terrible. Um, and this is, um, it, it's set, so it starts out, it's a flashback. So it starts out, you know, the disaster just happened, the kids are trying to deal with it. And then um, it goes back and tells you the story. Now, New London, Texas, um, in 1937, if you can imagine, um, the main character is Mexican. So there's a lot of prejudice. Um, there's a lot of um, kind of striation um, in the culture. And of course, you know, she's a girl and she's Mexican. Um, and so it's, it's a pretty tough place to live. Um, and then all of this happens. And um, so it's about this, this community that has to come together um, and kind of overcome the color lines, um, which is fascinating. This is an enormous book, though, I will warn you. Um, it is 400 pages, um, so not for the for the uh, not for the reluctant readers. Um, it actually has a feel of an adult book, and it might get more um, more attention in your adult section. Um, it kind of depends on your population. All right, um, you've probably heard of this one, David Almond. I have mixed feelings about David Almond. I think he's really weird. Um, his stuff just doesn't make any sense to me. 
Um, he's very philosophical and literary and I don't know. Um, but a song for Le Gray has gotten a lot of talk. Um, it kind of sounds like it's like sireny, um, mythological. There's a character named Orpheus. Um, I don't really know. I can't even tell from the descriptions what it's about. But I will tell you that if you have David Almond fans in your library or if you have people who like esoteric fiction, this one will probably circulate. Now, if you live in towns where that kind of stuff doesn't circulate like I did, then you probably don't need to own it. So there, you can have my permission. <laughs> All right, uh, there's a new Tim Wynn Jones out. Um, I don't know about this cover, but um, this looks like an interesting story. It's, I think, three perspectives. So it's about a kid um, named Evan, and his father is a pacifist. But his grandfather was a sergeant, I think, in the military. And so they had a falling out. And the father um, dies suddenly. And he, right before he died, he got a journal in the mail. And it's a journal of a Japanese soldier who was stranded on a Pacific island in World War II. And then the grandfather comes to take care of the boy to live with him. And so now there's this weird tension um, between, like, the ghost of the father and, you know, the rift between the father and the grandfather. <clears throat> and then you have the son who's trying to figure out why he was reading this journal, um, why this pacifist was reading this journal. Um, so from what I've read, it seems like it's told in a couple of different perspectives, um, perspectives of the people in the journal, the people who are stranded on the island, and then the father, uh, the grandfather and the son. Um, it looks like a really interesting story. Um, Tim Wynn Jones, if you know him, he does great, great stuff. Um, looks like a satisfying read. All right, Ray Carson has a new book. She wrote can never get the title right. Uh, the Girl of Fire and Thorns, which I adored. I love that book so much. Um, and I think this one looks very, very good. Um, it's probably um, the new, a new trilogy or a new series. Um, so this is about a girl who has a couple of secrets. Um, her first secret is that she can sense gold. Um, and so she um, can find it. And this is during the gold rush. And so she and her family are finding gold and they're making money, um, but she doesn't want to call any attention to herself. So um, they leave, live modestly and they don't tell anyone about her powers. But then someone murders her family and she's on her own. So she disguises herself as a boy. And so she has two secrets now. Um, and so she's trying to survive in this place um, where, you know, she has this unusual skill. It looks like an interesting story. It's kind of that combination historical fantasy, um, which she's really good at, um, and your teens are probably going to love it. This is a must purchase. Um, Rainbow Rowell is phenomenal. Uh, we all love her fangirl and um, uh, Eleanor and Park, absolutely phenomenal. This book looks hysterical. It's kind of a spoof on Harry Potter. Um, this is the the school map in the beginning of the uh, book um, and the description is hysterical um, it says Simon Snow is the worst chosen one who's ever been chosen um, and so um, someone is a vampire and um, there's a magic eating monster running around um, and it says it's a ghost story a love story and a mystery and it has just as much kissing and talking as you'd expect from a rainbow roll story but far far more monsters um, so this one looks like it's a little bit tongue-in-cheek it looks hysterical um, but it's got that same like level of humanity that you expect from rainbow roll so it's a big book but your teens are going to eat it up probably the adults too okay this book looks creepy all the Rage. This is Courtney Summers. She wrote, um, shoot, what's the name of that book she wrote? Um, Cracked Up to Be and That Kind of Girl, I think is what it's called. Um, so she writes really like gritty, um, kind of um, hard-hitting teen issue novels. This book um, is literally ripped from the headlines. Um, it is... Um, it's just crazy. Um, it's about um, this girl who um, knows a secret about the golden boy in school. And the problem is, is that his father is the sheriff, so no one believes her. And so she's been kind of run out of town, and she's branded a liar. Um, and 
but then someone turns up dead and is connected to both of them. And so um, she has to tell her story again. And I don't know what the story is, but in one of the reviews, there's something about rape. Um, and so it's going to come out again, and they, she has to get them to believe her um, in order to um, to make sure she, you know, she's not absolve her and also to get this kid knocked off his pedestal. Um, the cover looks darn creepy. Um, all right. Next, either the beginning or the end of the world. This book looks really interesting. Um, this is about a kid named Sophie. Again, it takes place in New Hampshire. Um, her mom is a Cambodian immigrant and she's kind of disappeared. Um, and she lives with her father, and she meets this boy who's just back from Afghanistan. He was an army network medic, sorry, and um, he is going through some PTSD. And um, then her father, of course, forbids her from seeing him, and she doesn't listen. And then she has to go live with her grandmother um, and her mother, and she starts learning about some of the horrible things that happened in Cambodia, um, including um, Khmer Rouge. And um, so the two kids are bonded over these traumas. Um, and it is a relatively short book, um, and it looks like an interesting kind of um, trauma story or drama story. All right, now this one is another rape book, and this one was the one I was talking about, Ripped from the Headlines. This one is actually based on a true story, which makes it that much more freaky. Um, it's about a bunch of kids who went to a party, and this kid doesn't remember what happened, but the next morning, um, one of her friends um, accuses one of the other friends of rape. Um, and so now the whole town is up in arms about this, um, and it's this whole controversial story, and, you know, what happened, and what did people see, and what did people um, not report, and this girl who doesn't remember anything, what does she not remembering. So hardcore, definitely not for the faint of heart or for the young, um, but it, I think your kids are going to like it. If you have teens in your library, this is the kind of stuff they like. Um, and it's going to creep us adults out because we know this stuff really happens. Whew, the stack is high. All right, that's all I have for you this month or rather right now. I'm going to do another one in a few weeks because I know I'm still behind. I'm terrible. Um, this is my contact information. Send me an email. Give me a call anytime. Um, I would love book requests, um, things that I should be reading, things that you think are fabulous. Um, I also do run the two big um, book award, um, the book awards in the state, the GMBA and the Dorothy Canfield Fisher. Um, so if you think there are books we should be considering for that, definitely let me know. I'm happy to talk to you. And with that, have a fabulous November. Stay warm.